so pleased to meet you. How do you do? Or see you again, I should say. I am pleased to introduce Jody Fenton, who will be the moderator of the panel discussion. She is the manager of special collections at the Hugh and Jane Ferguson Seattle Room of the Seattle Public Library. In addition to her work at Seattle Public Library, Jody has been active in the Seattle Area's Planning Commission for the celebration of the 150th anniversary of the birth of Edward Curtis. Thank you so much for having us here. It's really a pleasure to come and talk about this project that we've all been working on. And I know you've been hearing about, but maybe are interested in hearing more about it. So we're happy to have this opportunity to talk today. But I, uh, I didn't come alone, because this is not the kind of topic that we're going to talk about um, uh, uh, as a solo, as a solo uh, team here, solo person. We're going to have a team of people, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves to you. Then we're going to look at where we've come in the project, and then we'll be looking at some questions that we have set out, uh, where you'll hear uh, the panelists discuss some of the important issues. So first of all, let's introduce the panel. Hello, my name is Shannon Coppola. Um, I have a uh, master's in museology. Um, my previous work includes, I'm also hoping, sorry, previously <laughs> my work includes working with the National Park Service with their National NACRA program, as well as working with the Arizona State Museum. Uh, locally, I've worked in exhibitions at Shihuly Garden and Glass, and now currently I'm the uh, project coordinator for the Beyond the Film campaign. Hi, my name is Lydia Saigo, and I'm the curator archivist at the Suquamish Museum. And um, I am second generation curator archivist. I grew up in the museum with my dad, Charlie Saigo, and I went with him while he gathered um, photographs and artifacts um, to create our museum, which opened in 1986. So I'm excited to work here on the Curtis uh, Project, and this is my friend Miranda. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Miranda Villardi Lewis, I'm Zuni and Clinkett. I'm an independent curator here in the Puget Sound area, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington in the Information School. See, I've, I've brought the experts <laughs> today. Um, so uh, about two years ago, maybe three years ago, we started thinking about the potential of what, what, what was then viewed as the sesquicentennial of the birth of Edward S. Curtis. Uh, we want to claim him as a native son, um, not quite native, but he certainly spent a huge amount of time here and um, had enormous impact on our community. So we put together an advisory group to begin thinking about how we might celebrate the 150th uh, anniversary. However, as we delved into looking at this complex topic, looking at Curtis, we also wanted to bring in uh, a strong and centered native voice. And in order to do that, we, and I'm going to say we as a white person, had to re-examine our own perspectives on Edward S. Curtis and the kinds of things that were happening and take a longer, bigger, more expansive and inclusive view. And I have to say this journey has only begun for me personally, um, and I'm really looking forward to, um, to, to continuing on it. But I also know that this journey is important for the community to do as well, especially in the heritage community. Um, I was just talking with Carol Shank from the uh, uh, County, King County Archives, and she was explaining that they have um, digitized some important material which has in it information about native habitation uh, in, in the region. And these kinds of small details are hard to find. Um, they're hard for us to understand. Uh, they're hard for us to incorporate into history without allies and partners in trying to uh, figure it all out. So that's what this whole project has become. And uh, we, d we we're going to call it Edward S. Curtis and the North American Indian, among other <coughs> titles. Uh, but we have decided to call it Beyond the Frame to be Native. We wanted to look at Curtis's frame what he was looking at, and try to understand as much about that as we can. Uh, but we wanted to go beyond that frame and understand the whole aspect of being a Native American and the uh, uh, cultural history uh, that they have had. So that said, we're gonna, can, I, can I just, I want to see if I can click the, 
the, uh, I want to show you a little bit about how this um, website will look. So at the, at the turn of the century, this is what Curtis was doing. He began this decades-long project right, to photograph Native people. People he mistakenly thought were on the verge of extinction, although they had suffered tremendously, they were not <coughs> vanishing. Today, we know his work leads not to a lost past, it drives us to a thriving present. And I think that's the gist of where the Beyond the Frame project will go and what you see happening all throughout this year will be um, information from this website, will tell you about exhibits, lectures, programs, performances, uh, opportunities, workshops of all sorts, all throughout this region that will help you explore some of these important issues. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these issues now with my wonderful panelists. We're, we're going to look at some big concepts and then the panelists will respond, respond to them. So the first one that I wanted to talk about um, was history. And um, not, not just what we think we already know, but, um, but real history, you know, what, is, what, what that can possibly mean. So federal policies toward Native Americans had harmful impacts on thousands of people, forcing tribal members to live on reservations, removed from their traditional ways of providing for their families, separating children from their parents, and forcing them to abandon their culture, and forcing tribes into extreme poverty. The idea for the North American Indian, the monumental 20 volume set that Curtis produced, um, was to present the past glory of indigenous people. And Curtis describes this with this, this phrase, the present was all of decline, the future practically non-existent, the past glorious. So I want to challenge Curtis, and I think our panelists will respond to that. Um, who, would like, who would like to go first? Um, well, I, coming from a tribal museum, I think I was um, really spoiled in that way to always get to see our history told um, through our own voices and through the voices of our ancestors. And um, my dad worked with the Seattle Art Museum on a Curtis exhibit in the 90s, and it was called Shadowy Evidence, and they had a poster, and we actually had it hanging in our house for a few years that said, the camera never lies, but the word never was covered by um, three Curtis photographs, so it said the camera lies. And my dad explained it to me that, um, and he was a big fan of Curtis, and he still has Curtis photographs hanging in his house, but that these photos were posed, and that he would throw you know, a cedar shawl over people's cotton clothes and then take their picture um, reminiscent of the past. So a lot of people, um, as a historian, I know that a lot of people believe that these photos are older than they are, and they don't realize that these were in the early 1900s. They think that they were you know, 50, 70, 80 years um, before that. So for me, it's important to talk about um, the context of what was happening to tribes at the time, that it was illegal for them to um, practice their religion, that their children were being taken away and put in boarding schools, that they weren't allowed to leave the reservation, which was really affecting um, them being able to access food and being forced to eat government rations. So uh, when we talk about Curtis, I think it's really important to realize that he was at this time trying to show people that were living in poverty um, in their former glory, and we really appreciate that because it does show the beauty and the strength of our ancestors. But there's another part of the story, and that's um, the story of their resilience and protecting um, our history at, at a time that it was illegal. And I know that we're going to get into this later when we're talking about um, policy and curriculum, but also that um, the images that Curtis created, and they're beautiful images, you know, nobody can argue with that. But um, the images have really frozen us in a certain moment in time. And um, I was thinking about something that um, Mr. Hayes said um, earlier was that, you know, we have to think about this idea of space 
and think about the history that's being created right now. And in part because of Curtis's images um, looking older than they are and now being in the public domain <coughs> being available to everybody, um, they're so accessible and widely used for a variety of purposes. But at the same time, they're still freezing us in the past. They're freezing us in that past historical moment. And we're not allowing, um, they don't allow a public imagination for what the future of natives is and will be. We're just kind of stuck there. And so to think about the enduring <laughs> legacy of images, um, and Curtis isn't the only one that created these beautiful images. So looking at people like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Frank Hamilton Cushing, Matilda Cox Stevenson, I'm from um, Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico, and those images really have frozen us um, in a way that prevents um, this imagining of what it is for Native people moving forward. And so that's something to keep in mind when we're looking at these historical documents as photographs. And just to add to Miranda's, um, Miranda's note, um, working at Julie Garden in Glass, for example, Dale Julie has a beautiful Northwest room with his collections. Being a private collector, he has Curtis photo Bears. Um, it wasn't his intention for that particular exhibit to have any sort of contact. So yes, it does continue to freeze us in time. And when we have thousands of guests coming through the exhibition, you'll have people pose very stoically with the uh, with the images. And you know, as a native person, I'm supposed to be able to like to. Um, educate, but in that particular context, that's not what was that's not what was required of me. So I felt very torn. Um, so I think that um, you know his work does does good in the fact that it does record a, t a time in history, but it also does a lot of harm. Any follow up? Okay, so so that's the kind of stuff we were learning, right? It's it's not it's not. Easy. It's not simple. It's not cut and dry. Um, it's dynamic. It moves. It's living, um, and it's really uh, uh, the point of studying history. I think is to understand those kinds of things and and to incorporate them into our lives and perspectives. Our next um, uh, theme is context. Um, you know, and I'm sure the panelists will talk more about this, the context in which Curtis was taking photographs is quite controversial. There are many things that were happening that don't, that now make us feel like these were not um, authentic documents of the time. Um, they were staged or posed or things were added or changed or not respectful of particular cultures, um, uh, identities, and, and so forth. However, um, the uh, Curtis and his colleagues collected information about Native Americans, um, and much more than just the photographs. The 20 volumes are filled with text that includes uh, language, legends, rituals, origin stories, and a variety of and very interesting observations, all in these appendices in, in the books. Um, how to use that text to help create context for what Curtis was actually trying to create and then maybe how to take that limited body of contextual information and bring it forward into today's, um, today's exhibition or programming environment. I think our panelists will respond to that. Well, for me, uh, the North American Indian and the section on my tribe, the Suquamish tribe, has amazing text about Jacob Wahalchu, who was one of the Suquamish leaders. He signed the Treaty of Point Elliot um, with Chief Seattle. And in uh, the North American Indian, it talks about all of these numerous vision quests that he went through to try to um, gain spiritual power. And I, you know, we never would have been able to have this information if Curtis hadn't collected it um, from Jacob Wahalchu. So it really paints um, a much deeper picture. And I'm sure if Curtis knew that his photos were just being, um, how widely spread they are today without that text, that he would be really upset because he did so much work um, showing these beautiful, varied cultures uh, that we are really losing a lot when we only present them with just the images and without that context. So 
I think it's really important that um, we do that research and look at the texts that went along with these photos, um, the songs and recordings, um, because when we, these photos, they don't have any copyright, it's expired, so that's even more of a reason that they're so wild, widely distributed. But uh, we, re we all lose a lot when we don't um, have that text and songs and recordings accompanying the pictures. So I really encourage you, if you do use Curtis works um, in your exhibits, to not just use the photos, but, but do more research into um, what Curtis was saying about the photos, because I don't, this was not his intention at all to have um, the photos separated um, from all of this research. And even a basic level of acknowledgement of that the people in the photographs were people, um, because he does name them in the text a lot of times, and their names are not associated with the photos. So then you see a whole bunch that say Hopi Maiden, okay. Hopi Women with Water, you know, Zuni Brave. And it's really annoying because you know that these are families, these are from people's families, they still exist today. And if they knew that that was their relative, sometimes you can tell because people knew about those photos and they hold on to them in their homes. And they would say, remember that time that that guy came? And you know, they, it's still a live memory for us. And um, another person that did this, you know, for, for the Zunis is Cushing. Like we think of Cushing as our anthropologist because he spent so much time there and built his career um, off of our, uh, recording our lives. And we know who we took photographs of, but for many Native people, um, it, we just get flattened by um, having one of our ancestors portrayed as an Indian youth or Indian matron or Indian, whenever it doesn't have a name, even just a name associated, um, that is really disheartening to see because you know that that's somebody's relative. They lose their voice. Right, that's another way to lose the voice of, um, in the Native perspective, of a human, humanist perspective. The um, uh, it's it's so true, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you tell a story <laughs> I may um, how uh, how I met Shannon. You know, um, at the Seattle Public Library, we are blessed with two sets of the North American Indian. We recently were gifted one from Harry Bullock, which has just been phenomenal to have have the second set. Uh, people can come and make appointments to look at any volume that they want. We show the show the the portfolio and the physical volume and talk with them about the um, tribal groups that they're seeing in, in, in books. Well, one day we had the Chihuly curators asked to come and see a book. And um, uh, my favorite book at, at that time was the Hopi volume. So I pulled it out and we're showing these wonderful curators this great, great set of, of images. And Shannon's sitting there um, as a as a Hopi, but I didn't know this, and we're holding these pictures up and talking, you know, knowledgeably about the Hopi. <laughs> and, yeah, right, <laughs> that's right. And there were, there were questions, and we were like, oh, you know, we can't really answer that question. No, we'll have to get back to you on that one. And about a third of the way, maybe half the way through, Shannon started narrating and talking about what was in the pictures and what she understood and knew, and it was just, it was so inspiring and moving to have someone there who was um, so intimately involved and, and could bring, you know, bring depth and definition to an image that we only see as a pictorialist um, photograph. So uh, thank you, Shannon. It made a huge difference. Um, and we talk about it even today. We talk, oh, remember when Shannon came? <laughs> it was very, very important. So I think that brings me into the next, the next um, topic, the next concept is narrative. The, um, what's, what we see, people, you know, when you see the Curtis photograph or Curtis image, you begin to develop some sort of narrative in your own mind about what it is. Oh, that is, you know, some, it's a warrior, it's a, it's a shaman, it's a, you know, a, 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 
a group of baskets. It's, it's whatever you see, you know, you're going to bring that narrative, your own narrative to it. And my question to the panelists is how do we create a different kind of narrative around the images and around the work of Curtis and around Native, uh, Native American history uh, and American, the history of the American West? How do we create a, na a narrative that's inclusive and explains things better and helps us understand some of the, you know, uh, some aspects of the history that maybe aren't covered very well? Um, for me, it is really frustrating sometimes when I do talk to other historians about Curtis because the attitude is that Curtis saved our culture, and that is just not true. Our ancestors saved our culture, and they were doing it when it was illegal. And so um, that's the way that we tell the story. And so I would encourage you to look at things um, from a Native perspective and do that by, by doing research and seeing um, the Native voice at the time, because at this time period and you know just having a faceless just or a voiceless Suquamish woman standing there and just her portrait you it looks like our people were weak and they were just letting these terrible things happen to them and that is not true and if you look at um, Indian agent letters from treaty time up until Curtis's time and even after that they were constantly um, being harangued by the tribal members and saying, you need to write to Washington and they need to keep these promises that they had in the treaties. And they weren't just sitting down and letting these things happen to them, they were being very politically active. And um, Jacob Wahalchu, who I referenced before, he, in 1864, we have a photo in our museum of our tribal leaders going down to Olympia to protest the size of the reservation because they gave us a very small reservation compared to this huge land base um, that we had before. So all of, you know, 40, 50 people from my tribe went and traveled all the way to Olympia by canoe over 50 nautical miles um, to go protest this, and the size of our reservation was doubled the next year. So, you know, when I look at my ancestors, they did this for us, and they were fighting and saying, why are we getting kicked out of our fishing areas? Why are we getting kicked out of our hunting areas? And because they were fighting those battles, those letters were used later in court cases preserving treaty rights that I enjoy today. So this, they're not just some dusty documents on the shelf, they're preserving um, you know, my son's treaty fishing rights and hunting rights in the future. So uh, the work that our ancestors did, they're still protecting us. So uh, we want to acknowledge all of the work that they did and they weren't just you know, the images that people have of Indians living in poverty and, oh, their land got stolen from them. No, they were fighting um, for us the whole time. So that's what we need to look deeper um, into the way that people talk about Native Americans and, and about all different um, racial and ethnic groups and religious groups in our area because there's always these stereotypes and we're all fed these stereotypes about, about different groups. So when we look deeper, um, we really see the beauty and the strength of these people when we get to know their individual stories. <clears throat> um, Tracy Rector is a um, Native curator, um, filmmaker, and she's one of the artists who is exhibiting at the SAM um, alongside the works of Curtis that are going to be up this summer. And um, she has these protest signs, and one of them says, Native rights are human rights. And so I think if you look at the history of federal Indian policy um, and specifically how it all shook out here in Washington State, I think if you take the time to really have these conversations with the people that are coming in, with your volunteers, with your board, about how policy um, that affects Native people has now has implications for how the, all everybody else is being treated. And I think if you put that in the context of present day events, um, you can see everybody's civil rights being threatened. And that really starts with whatever is happening to Native people. Where um, my husband likes to call us the, the human canaries in the coal mine because the things that, you, that um, environmental and policy, um, the legal aspects, of what are happening to Native people, how our rights are being threatened, is just the start. So when you look at how it was supposed to happen, 
And what it really is happening now, and you can see this long historical trajectory, and I don't mean historical that it was only in the past. It started a long time ago, and it continues up until today. And who knows what the future is going to hold. We're seeing it all being very shaky right now. And I think that um, heritage, the heritage community can really play a pivotal role in educating because we all know that if we don't pay attention to what happened in the past, the history will repeat itself. We're seeing that right now. And for anybody whose rights have, if you felt like your rights have been threatened in the last year or so, you have just experienced what it is to be a Native person in this country. And that this is our entire existence, is being aware that our rights are continually being chipped away. And that there is this pervasive move to chip away these civil rights. And so if you put it into context like that, the heritage community has this immense privileged standpoint of being aware of what has happened and what the dangers are continuing down certain paths. Um, and just to add to that point as well, um, I think it's really important to be able, uh, because we are the, um, I guess we are the, the individuals with that traditional knowledge and being able to partner with Native Americans to be able to tell those stories and tell those histories, I think it's really important that, to be able to partner and even if it's just asking someone and consulting to make sure that whatever exhibit that you're putting on um, has that voice present, I think that's really important. So um, our our next our next topic, and we're gonna we're, there's gonna be time for questions um, and answers. These these lovely ladies will give the answers. I will not only the attempts, but um, but there'll be question question and answers in just just a minute or two here. The um, we want to talk about education. Um, we've seen it and the beyond the frame uh, uh, has has seen it in ourselves and we've seen it in our own institutions that. If you can learn about this, you have a really good chance of, of creating a narrative, providing context, um, looking at the real history and trying to figure things out and presenting it in a way that works. There's a, and you may all be aware of this, a new Washington State curriculum called Since Time Immemorial, which offers a lot of support for teaching um, Native American history in our, in our public schools. It has, a, uh, has just launched um, uh, and a lot of people are using it, and there are a lot of questions. And I know that tribal <coughs> members are receiving questions um, about how to go about it, what kinds of information they can use. And I wanted to give the panelists an opportunity to talk about the education and perhaps um, some perspective on the, the new curriculum. And Miranda, you may be the first to start with this one. You know, Washington State isn't the first one to have um, Native curriculum statewide. Uh, Montana started with um, Indian Education for All, and that's K through 12. And um, it provides standard curriculum for teaching Native history. But Washington State is going to be the first state to mandate teacher training to teach um, since time immemorial. That's being sponsored and was initiated by um, education professors at the University of Washington, particularly Megan May. And um, that is going to be, they're anticipating that's going to be signed into law later this year. But um, it's a great place to start. It's a great place to um, access more um, broader issues of how Indian and Native history um, affects different issues in everybody else's life. It was, uh, whether it's about treaty rights versus sports, fishermen, or land base and access to clean water. You know, again, these ideas that these are native rights. So it's not just for every, it's not just for natives. You know, these rights affect everybody. We saw that in um, Standing Rock this past, our last winter. You know, they were fighting for the, um, for the access to clean water. Not just for the native community, but for millions of people downstream. And so however um, these different curriculums can be used in your own institutions, um, you know, they're free, they're open to everybody. It doesn't mean that you have to cater to um, the K through 12 
community that comes through, but it's a great place to start. Yeah, I think that the um, Since Time and Memorial is a great curriculum and tribes um, are helping add to that. Uh, the one thing, like Miranda mentioned, I think that's most important is educating people about treaties and about treaty rights. And, uh, you know, there would be no land here for the U.S. to govern if they didn't have treaties. So it is not okay for the treaties to be broken. And uh, in the 1970s, with Judge Holt's decision, he said that 50% of the fish belong to the tribes. Well, 50% also belongs to non-tribal members. And the second part of the Bolt decision dealt with um, the environment. And the federal judge said, what good is a right to dip your net in the water if it comes up empty? So that also is for everyone in Puget Sound. We all share this fish, and we're holding it in trust for the next generations. So these treaty rights are being used to fight for all of our children, all of our grandchildren, all of our great-grandchildren's right uh, to clean water, to healthy salmon, to have salmon, to still eat. So uh, the more that we get this message out about treaties in the Constitution, it says any treaty entered in with the federal government is the supreme law of the land. So these are the laws that are going to be there to help protect our kids' um, fishing, water, hunting rights. And that's for everybody. So the more we educate people about treaties, they don't talk about this in schools. They don't maybe gloss over the Trail of Tears and you know, give, give this very, very like Native American history light lesson because there's a lot of shameful things in our history and our government does not want to talk about those things. But it's important as historians that we look at um, what really happened here, the land beneath our feet. And in my tribe, I've had people come in um, who live on my reservation and they bought a house and they go back in the history of their home and it says there's a um, bill of non-confidency where elders, if they didn't speak English because they were raised learning to Lashutsi, could be considered non-competent and have their land taken away. So, so many people, even on the reservation where the land was supposed to be reserved for them, had their walk, because we live in this beautiful waterfront area, had their land taken away because they didn't speak English. So, if we look at the history um, of what happened in this country, it's not a beautiful history. There's a lot of really um, horrible things that happened. There's a lot of stolen land. There were children that were taken away and abused in boarding schools. and hit with the ruler every time they would say a word from their native language. So um, we need to talk about these things even though they're difficult. And we need to talk about treaties and we need to talk about treaty rights because that is going to be key um, in protecting the environment for future generations. And the kids, they're the ones that seem to understand this. When I have youth come in, they're doing reports about the Bolt decision. Um, they want to learn about treaty rights. They want to learn about other cultures. So I think it is we have to keep you know, teaching these young people because they're the ones who have the most open minds. Thank you. The, um, one of the revelations that I had when I was um, uh, learning more about Curtis was his, uh, his work at the Battle of the Little Bighorn and his analysis of what was happening there. And I think um, I think it fits in with, uh, with the fact that what I think, and, and I could be wrong, so, yeah. but I'm thinking that uh, Curtis would be really happy to see us um, having this conversation we're having today because it is daylighting issues that were important to him as well, and I, that's why I brought up the battle a little bit more because he, he worked with Native informants, Native, Native scouts who were on the field when the battle was taking place and revised Curtis essentially because of that, that information that he got. He was able to revise what happened at the Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, that information, that article that he wrote, was not widely distributed. You could read it now, but you couldn't read it back at that time. I think, I think Curtis would be pleased that uh, these kinds of issues are being discussed and, um, and looked at. And yes, they're, they're difficult and painful, uh, and, but if we don't discuss them, I think they'll become even more painful. So I think, I think the timing is good. I'm gonna stop there unless you guys want to uh, wrap up what you're thinking and then we'll go to Q&A. I want to get, you've been sitting here patiently yeah. listening to all of this. And 
know? Yes. One of the benefits of having his images out in the public domain is the appropriation by Native people of Curtis images. And there's several, um, there's many artists that just grab his stuff off the interwebs and add um, positive messages for other Native people. And so this here, the caption on this um, image says, I'm the product of all the ancestors getting together and deciding these stories need to be told. And this is um, this was posted on an Instagram page of an online um, Native Femme magazine, Indigenous Goddess Gang. Uh, you can follow them on Instagram. They also did this one. When you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Because traditionally, as mothers, we are the first teacher. Our, our level of consciousness will directly influence the next generation. This is um, this is just text on a photo, you know. But this um, when I screenshotted this off my Instagram feed, and at the time it had over 1,200 people hearted it, you know, they liked it, and um, have reposted it. And so there's this way of um, natives appropriating Curtis images um, to make it what they want it to be, and the agency of these women in this photo is now being replicated by the agency of whoever made this meme. And they, you can also see um, Curtis images in the artwork of Stephen Paul Judd, who is a Kiowa artist. He's a prolific artist, incredible. And he does these digital mashups where he'll do a Curtis image of this serene teepees on a riverbank, and then he'll put Godzilla in there, like coming out of them. So they're really funny. Or he'll have the Braves pointing their arrows up to the sky, you know, getting ready to hunt air or clouds, or I don't know what they were doing, but they were posing. And in the image, he has um, um, an Atari game, you know, with, um, I can't remember what the, what the name of the game is, it's Space Invaders. And so then they're shooting their arrows at Space Invaders coming down, you know, and so then he's simultaneously acknowledging this past, this romanticized image, but pushing us forward and saying, no, we play video games, and maybe they did too. They would have loved video games. And um, that's just the moment in time that they were captured. And so the, the reclamation of the Curtis imagery by Native artists is really exciting. It's really fun. Sometimes it's turned on its head to show just how, how some things haven't changed. Um, and those images are heartbreaking but they are always referencing the agency of Native people to take back these images and claim them as our own because that is us up there. Those are our ancestors. And even when they were taken to show this glorified past that no longer was, and you know, it's not a lament anymore. This is a celebration and this is reaffirmation that we're going to be continuing to making images of our own, and that our voices need to be present always. Um, yeah, I really like what you said, Miranda, and that artist Steve Paul Judd has um, a piece of artwork that I like with some native imagery, and then it says still here on it, and that is what we were trying to tell people. We are still here, and we've been here this whole time, but I think as historians, we have to take sometimes these stereotypical stories about ourselves and sometimes that's what brings people in the door of my museum is they have this idea of natives as mystical and spiritual and they come in thinking along those lines but it's our job then to tell the full story after that so even if that is why they're coming in the door we have to tell um, the real story um, behind these pictures so I think it's um, you know, Edward Curtis's images are so beautiful and they are so powerful, but we have a duty to talk about what was really going on at the time. And then just to add to that, um, I think that's one of the main reasons why I got into museums and decided to pursue the program that I did because it allowed me to be able to tell these stories about objects that are used every day in every household and seeing them like in a cabinet and seeing them locked away, there's use to those things, there's stories behind it. Sometimes these objects are passed down through families and that sort of thing and um, that's what 
why I wanted to pursue what I did because I can add to that story. I can add to um, you know the future history of that potential object. All right, that concludes our part of this show. So um, if you have some questions, you yeah, Brian. Can, can you just share a little bit for those who don't know the, the project, how long it's going to last? Some of the partners that are involved, any folks are interested in being involved, how they can participate? Yeah, I have. Um, thank you, Brian. This is um, Beyond the Frame. This is our uh, our kickoff event, which is February 16th at the Chihuly Glass House. I'll have these out on the desk, on the table, and you can take one with you. It's an invitation to come to the kickoff. I hope you all can come. It's going to be quite quite an event. Um, the Beyond the Frame starts on February 16th, officially, uh, and will go until the end of the year. It will be a, a number of organizations, some of them are listed here, that are doing exhibitions. The SAM exhibit is a good example. There'll be a, an exhibit at the uh, Museum of Northwest Art in the Connor, uh, the Winch, I'm sorry, and the the Suquamish Museum, of course. <laughs> see, see what I mean? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, your toes here. Um, uh, it's doing a great exhibit there, um, and there'll be there'll be many others uh, through uh, through the through the uh, year. It is a year long um, celebration. We wanted there to be plenty of time for people to uh, uh, to visit the museums on the website that will be going live shortly. There'll be a map, and you'll be able to plan your, your, your itinerary and look at different things that are happening all throughout the um, Pacific Northwest. Um, the Wenatchee Art Museum is going to be involved, as, as will some of the other museums in the Metal Valley uh, and, and the Yakima. So there's, there are a lot of things that will be going on. What is that? Then, we, we, since, since Brian, I, I'm going to also do one more thing. Uh, we have a couple members of the advisory group here today, and I was hoping I could introduce them. Brian Carter has been on the advisory group for us, and has been very helpful. And Bob Lindquist is sitting here. He's, he was one of the original uh, members of the advisory group when we started, and it was still all about Curtis, and um, has watched this whole project uh, grow into something, um, something uh, more inclusive. That, or maybe deeper, or something, some word like that. Okay, I'll uh, real quick. Yeah. yeah. And um, I would like to encourage you, you know, as we're thinking about all of these different institutions that are participating at the city, county, tribal, and state level, um, to I, I hope that something that we've said here today really sparks your imagination to to decenter Curtis because we are here putting him on this ultimate year-long pedestal <laughs> and even though we're problematizing him and I hope that we brought up some critiques of the the process and his legacy because we are putting the, collectively an immense amount of resources towards celebrating him and if that could go towards your educational programming, if that can bring in Native people, if that can change the way that you think about him, because otherwise we're putting all this money into, I mean, it might as well be called Curtis 150 still. <coughs> and you, changing the name doesn't change the impact or the reverence that is being placed on him. And so I just want to offer that as um, for your consideration to try to work with your own collections to really challenge yourselves and challenge your, your patrons, your visitors, to really think about what, what is it that you're trying to get across here? Is this Curtis, yay, without that critical thought? Or are you bringing in all of your expertise and all of your knowledge and the strength of your collections to really challenge what it means to have a legacy like his? Yes. I'd like to put a word in for the museum that's way out on the Olympic Peninsula, I forgot its name, that's connected with the, with the uh, Mia Bay area of slide, which had a big archaeological mosaic. Right. It's the Macaw uh, Research and Cultural Center. Yes, I was a college student when they first started doing the dig there. Got to see some of the uh, initial 
field work and uh, that tied in very strongly with the whole decision. Yes, that would, I encourage everyone to go to that museum. It's one of my favorite museums yeah. I've ever been to. They have an amazing archaeology collection there. Plus, it's just a beautiful spot. It's mm -hmm. just gorgeous. Everything about it is it's lovely. I think we have time for one more, and then I think we're, we're yeah. What's the question? Have you envisioned a curriculum being developed through this project, and will it go national, or is it mostly? So um, uh, there, there is a state curriculum and, it, and it, it has a website and it's called Since Time Immemorial. So that's a, that's a really good place to start. All 29 recognized tribes have been involved in that. I believe the Duwamish as well, I think. I think. And so that's, I think, um, a good place to start. In terms of a national response, um, this has come up in the advisory group, it's also come up in meetings at the at my institution, the Seattle Public Library, with our foundation, looking at um, it, the idea that is is this some kind of model or template that that for some perspective, concept, philosophy that we're developing here, um, since we have so many active tribes uh, and we have good relationships overall, I'm going to say. <laughs> Again, they'll, they'll let me know if I'm overstepping my bounds here. Um, you know, that, that I think we have an opportunity that maybe doesn't exist uh, uh, everywhere. So um, yes, I think there will be some conversation about whether this moves after 2018, what this might look like. Um, I don't know yet what that might might be. We're, I mean, we're thinking about a feasi, uh, feasibility grant to try to explore that idea uh, that the library would host something like that. But that's as far as our thinking is fine. So I think, I think we're. Can we get responses also from the rest of you oh, about yeah, that course. possibility? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Um, I remember there is, um, the North American Indian is available on the web. And I just sent it as a reference for a college student that was doing um, a report on intertribal warfare. And so it's wonderful to, if you look up Curtis, you'll be able to find it um, pretty easily. And um, it has all of the text that we were talking about on there. And I know on the advisory board we talked, and I'm not sure what happened with the talking about the website and how much historical information was going to be available on that site or not. Yeah, for, for Curtis, there will there'll be a, a learn more about Curtis section on the website and we'll have references back to that Northwestern University online uh, North American Indian. So I think, and that there'll be other things as well. But, um, um, it's not there yet. No, it's not, it's not there yet, but we're getting there. Yeah. I just, uh, my name is Lynn, I'm from Mohai, and I just want to uh, express a heartfelt thanks uh, for this incredible discussion uh, with the hope that uh, this recording can be made available. I would love for all of the Mohai staff to be able to listen to it. Um, hearing the native voices has been um, very illuminating and extremely helpful, so I just want to express my heartfelt gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank all the panelists for that fascinating discussion. Let's give them another hand.